Uh, let's get in. We're going to start with water quality treatment. There is a lot going on around this. I would say the last 10 years of my professional life has been devoted to trying to develop the perfect bioretention media treatment device. <laughs> a lot of it was prompted by uh, years ago by Lake Whatcom. And how are we going to deal with all this phosphorus and this, that, you know, and phos phosphorus, as it turns out, is probably the most difficult contaminant to deal with in bioretention. And we'll, we'll look at some data on that. Uh, we're getting close, though. So we're, we are. I think we are getting close. We've got some, our, our last batch of research we're actually is very promising, and we're starting, we're hope, hopefully going to start the next phase of that research. But I think we're closing in on, um, and I think, you know, this area, I mean, Whatcom and Bellingham, you guys have come up with some good solutions as well. So I think we're getting close, and particularly at kind of the state level as far as designing, implementing, specifying high-performance water quality treatment media uh, that does not leach nitrogen, phosphorus, or copper, and also is a high-performance treatment media and grows plants, cost-effective <laughs> and available, just a couple things to deal with there, um, you know, I think we're getting, we're getting a lot closer. One of the interesting things about bioretention is that basically all the primary treatment pathways that we think about for treating stormwater are active in bioretention areas. And that's very different for a water quality treatment. This particular practice will focus on one, two, or you know, maybe three things pathways as far as treatment pathways. But in bioretention, it's all happening. All the sort of convention, you know, the usual suspects, obviously, there's not reverse osmosis happening, right? <laughs> but all this other stuff. Volume reduction is, uh, I think, uh, number one. The less water you have to treat, likely the more successful you're going to be treating that water. If you have to treat large quantities of water, that gets incrementally more difficult than treating smaller amounts of water. Sedimentation, filtration, phytoremediation, primarily at the mi more at the micro scale. If you think about our part of the world, a lot of our stormwater happens in the winter, right? Are our plants really active in the winter? Eh, not really. Some of them are quite inactive. There may be some, but it's probably very little phytoremediation as compared to perhaps uptake uh, of contaminants if you're in the Midwest or East Coast where you get a lot of summer stormwater inputs and the plants are very active, a lot of uptake, and uh, probably more important in that case. What's important about uh, plants is what goes on underneath the ground. The roots penetrating that soil column, uh, keeping that media more permeable. Roots exude materials, carbohydrates for example, that support microbial populations that can be very important for soil structure, building soil structure, as well as pollutant uptake. Metals and phosphorus, for example. Then there's thermal attenuation. We've got some pretty good research on that, primarily from the East Coast. Temperature reduction, adsorption, volatilization. Where most of the work's going on right now, uh, the really complex piece of this, and where most of the work is going on right now is around the adsorption. And, that, and by that, I mean a whole class of um, treatment from adsorption to complexation and other ways that metals and, and contaminants are bound up. That's where, uh, that's the heart of it. That's where the media is, where most of the work is being done and that's where most of the research and um, activity is now around media. We're gonna look at some regional data from around the country, look at some research here. Uh, we're burrowing in a little bit deeper than some of the other parts of the country you know, doing a little bit different research than some other parts of the country. So let's start with volume reduction. This is a slide from different parts of the country, mostly from this part of the world. Uh, Siskiyou Green Street, uh, picture on the left, that's in Portland. Glencoe Rain Garden, Portland. Greensboro, North Carolina, so this is uh, most of the North Carolina stuff is uh, Bill Hunt's work. C Street, one of the first, well it was, the first kind of major um, street retrofit in Seattle, Northwest Seattle, 110th Cascade. That's uh, the picture second from the right. C Street is the one right in the middle. And then Meadow and the Hylobos, which was the first pilot project for Pierce County. And so this was a uh, 35 home subdivision, about eight, uh, eight point, about eight and a half acres. So these are uh, different projects, all using, all primarily relying on bioretention. And you can see the, 
project name, the date completed, the subgrade infiltration, not the infiltration rate of the media. Sizing, so for example, Siskiyou Green Street, the buy retention area is 6% of the contributing area. That's pretty typical. For our part of the, typical in the United States, as you'll see, for treatment around 5%. Not always, but that's a very typical number. Ranging on up to 10 and 15% for our part of the world, if you have a difficult site and you're thinking about um, you know, more rigorous flow control. So it depends on your objective for this sizing factor. Uh, you can see the C Street was quite small. And then you see down at the bottom, metal on the high levels, 15%. Look at the infiltration rates. And that was one of the first pilot projects in the region, a whole subdivision. And so we were quite conservative on that one. I spent three years there monitoring that project, and it was very interesting to watch. Anyway, so you can see the, uh, the results there, pretty good. 83, 94% reduct, volume reduction for the, for the uh, overall runoff file for that project. C Street, 98%. I think they're still doing some monitoring there, and it continues to perform quite well. So you start to get into that 98%. Now you're into that realm of that more restrictive flow control guideline where you're managing most all your water on site. It really gets incrementally more difficult as you get into that, into that realm to get that, those last bits of volume. So you can see some pretty good flow reductions here. Met on the high levels in particular, we did not think it would meet that goal. So that met forested condition. That met the most rigorous condition. We had very poor soils there. That project was a surprise. But you can see the sizing factor was quite a bit larger. And in general, for poor soils, and we've often used 0.1 inches per hour for modeling scenarios, for till, and found that at about 10%, you start to get into that realm of being able to control about 90%, and then on up from there. And again, it gets incrementally more difficult to get those last bits. Uh, but 10 to 15% is very typical for our modeling. Uh, what our modeling is telling us at 0.1 inch per hour, uh, to be able to control virtually you know, most all your water on site. Um, so, uh, it varies, depends on the soils, your subgrade soils, but there, uh, that was uh, a surprise how well that, that project behaved. Soil, so this is a question that comes up a lot, right? Well, we're directing water to these things, contaminated stormwater, what's the contaminant buildup in these cells? Important to, to think about there, this stuff doesn't just sit there, uh, most of our contaminants. Organics are transformed, you know, hydrocarbons, for example, go through, are, are rapidly transformed. Uh, nutrients are constantly transforming in these systems, not always for the best. <laughs> Sometimes they're transforming to more soluble uh, um, species that are easily trans, uh, uh, transported out of the bioretention area. Metals are the exception to that. Metals are quite conservative. They don't just go away. Um, they'll stay in some form in the bioretention area, although they can be quite locked up. They can be complexed, surrounded by organic material or mineral uh, uh, molecules, by ligands. So they can be complex and, and essentially taken out of, they're not available, uh, but they're there. So metals are the conservative piece, but the hydrocarbons are organics, bacteria, those are, and nutrients are in constant transformation in these systems. Back to Siskiyou Green Street, a dense, older residential subdivision in Portland, and then 12th and Montgomery is a very urban Portland setting. And so Portland is doing some great monitoring. They're, they're taking soil samples in their bioretention areas at different depths. That's going to be some great information for us looking at this progression over time. We just want to point out at the bottom left, it's interesting to try to compare these levels of soil contamination to, you know, what would be a benchmark? You know, what, what would trigger some concern? Um, you know, it's hard to say. Copper is a great example. You can have a lot of copper in your soil and it's not a problem at all. You put a little copper, dissolved copper, in your, in, in receiving water and that can be a that can be a very serious problem as far as aquatic biota. The Model Toxics Control Act in the lower left there, there are a couple triggers for us for, for that regulation. For lead, 250 milligrams per kilogram. Mercury, two milligrams per kilogram. So there's a couple triggers you might look at just as far as comparison. And so you can see these different levels. For both of these projects, down to six inches, six to 12 inches, another sample, 12 to 18 inches, another sample. And you can see, for the most part, what you might expect. That is, you know, more higher levels at the, on the, near the surface.
So you, you can see in here a general pattern that you might expect. Well, Mercury is a little different, although you know that going from 0.032 to 0.054, there certainly could be measurement error there, and uh, I don't think that's a significant difference. And Mercury is a bit different. It's a different beast as far as how it cycles in the soils, and I don't know much about Mercury cycling, but there's a biotic com component, and who knows? be happening there. But that certainly could just be, that could be measurement error. I don't know. But otherwise, you're generally seeing a pattern that you might expect. Reduced uh, contaminant level concentrations as you move down through the soil column. And nothing really, um, so far, at this point, which is, uh, this was about two years ago, um, nothing that was a triggering concern. Percent removal and nutrients. We'll go through this pretty quickly. You have the slides, and so you can look at these. I'm going to point out Davis first, and then we'll talk about this two negative numbers. The Davis stuff was done in a lab and then out in the field. And you see that um, U and L, this is, these are big boxes in the lab, and there's an upper port that's at eight, about 18 centimeters, and a lower port at about, if I remember right, yeah, 61 centimeters. And uh, so they're taking effluent water at different levels to see is there better treatment as you move through the column. We're looking at total kilo nitrogen. This is in milligrams per liter, nitrate, and total phosphorus, and then hydrocarbons. There wasn't much work done at this point in hydrocarbons. You can see in general, certainly for the nutrients, as you move down through the column, treatment improves, right? You've got 38% for TKN at the upper port and 68 at the lower. We haven't found that, but they did. Now, nitrate. Negative 96%. What does the negative mean? It went up. Yeah. You're exporting. Not good. So we have found this, in fact, all the time for 60-40 for compost mixes. Then you go down the line there and you see mass removal. So now we're at 97%, 97, 99%. Uh, what's going on there? Why now, even at the negative, even at nitrate, high mass removal, but the concentration at the upper port, at least, it was actually more coming out of there than What's going on? Mass removal, that's load. Mass removal is concentration times what? Times the flow volume. What's happening here is they're actually, so they're, they're, the flow coming out is less than the flow coming in. So that's an example of volume reduction, how it plays into this load reduction. Going down to Hunt, Greensboro there, negative 240%. That's not an unusual number at all. We've seen uh, order of magnitude more than that in some, sometimes flushing. But total phosphorus, we've seen a lot of that with compost mixes, flushing, uh, export of uh, phosphorus. Oh, and you see down below here some bioswales and national bioswales. That's just some comparative data. So that's looking at, at these surface flow swales, you know, our typical filtration swales and comparative numbers there. Just for your reading pleasure. TSS and metals, we're looking at TSS there, copper, lead, zinc. And in general, we've seen in, in our part of the world pretty good metal capture, particularly zinc. If you have a zinc problem, we've got the answer for you. Uh, bioretention media uh, works beautifully for zinc. Even the current 6040. Virtually everything we've tested does well for zinc. Copper is another story. Uh, you can see here again Davis and Hunt, everybody with their media. This is the East Coast, good copper reduction in general. Don't have a lot of compost in them. They're generally some sort of topsoil with sand and mulch-ish stuff. Um, some sort of like leaf, decomposed leaf mulch. Uh, although these are a bit different measurements in that we don't know if they're measuring initial flush on these. So at any rate, this is some of the, re, you know, some of the, some of the national data that we people worked off of for, you know, for years. You know, Davis and Hunt, those was some of the first experiments. Eh, that's probably what we should expect from bioretention media.